Good evening. So thankful to see you. So delighted to worship again tonight. We're thankful for you and your presence. We're always grateful to study together as well. We'll start in Acts 12, actually look at a section of the text uh, that we referenced this morning and used this morning as a launching point. But we'll look at a few more that come from this week's reading, this past week's daily Bible reading. And then we'll anchor ourselves back in Acts 2. So Acts chapter 12, we'll get there shortly. Several years ago, I got to thinking probably eight, nine, maybe even ten years ago, I had a friend who pointed me toward a, a story that ESPN had done about a, a man who had played Division I college athletics. I believe he played lacrosse at Boston College. And he had gotten a, a, pr a pretty good job out of college uh, with one of the investment firms that was housed in the World Trade Center in the South Tower. And just had been there just, uh, I guess, upon graduation, just a few months perhaps even. And he was there that day, South Tower, when the, the plane hit. And so the, it's a pretty powerful story because he had some firefighter training. He was in good shape because he was an athlete. And he just always had this work ethic. And he helped people to make it out alive. And he didn't make it out alive and, and gave his life for that cause. And they found his body about six months later. And they figured out it was probably in the lobby of that South Tower, the one that fell first, was struck second. And it was found among firemen, and they presume and are able to piece together eyewitness testimony that he could have escaped. He could have went out the front door, as so many that he had delivered had done. But because he was a firefighter at heart and had that training, he was huddling with them to help them know more about what was upstairs and be able to assist them in all that they were doing. What happened is all these eyewitnesses kept talking about this man that they just heard his voice. He was strong, voiced, clear with instructions. He told them, if you have this training, do this. If you're located here, do this. He just had a clear mind and a clear voice and told them what to do. And he led them out to safety. It's estimated that he helped 18 people come to safety. And in the course of this 12 to 13 minute documentary that ESPN has done, and I try to watch it every year on the anniversary What's happened is they all say, we didn't know the guy, but he had on a red bandana on his face. And so that red bandana kept coming up with these survivors. Well, that red bandana was something his dad had given him as a young boy. You keep your white handkerchief when you're somewhere nice, but when it's time to work, you put on your red bandana. So when it came time to work, to deliver people, to rescue people, he put on the red bandana. What's interesting is in all the times I've seen that, I've seen people who survived because of him put their name on the screen. I've seen their name, heard their name. I still don't know any of those survivors' names. It's not anything negative. I'm not against those survivors. I, I don't, I'm thankful that they're alive. But the focus is on the hero, right? The focus is on the one who brought them to safety, not on them. And he told them things to do. If you can help, help. If you can hear my voice, follow. If you can make it to the elevator, here's where it's at. If you can go down these steps, do this. He was telling them what to do. They did it. They complied, and they found safety. But the emphasis, the attention is all on him because of his heroism. I can tell you his name in a heartbeat. His name is Wells Crowther. We know his name. He's the focus of the story because he is the one who brought people to safety. Just think about that nugget of truth. That when people provide rescue and safety, they are the ones that deserve the credit. And in no way does when they tell people what to do in order to enjoy that rescue, does that take away from the efforts of the rescuer. Acts chapter 12. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord stood next to Peter in the prison. We talked about this morning. A light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, listen, get up. Quickly, the chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, dress yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Notice in those two verses, five commands given by the angel to Peter. Get up quickly, dress yourself, put on your sandals, wrap your coat around you and follow me. The Lord was acting in this instance miraculously, but he still told Peter some things to do in order to receive the deliverance he was providing. 
We read this story in Acts chapter 12. Who do we say does the rescuing? Who is responsible for the rescuing? No one in reading the text responsibly would say, well, that's Peter. He earned it. He caused it to happen himself. He worked that out and he made it happen. Nobody would say that. It's clearly the Lord who caused it. It's the angel who made it happen. But Peter complied with the instructions, the commands given in order to receive the deliverance provided by the Lord. Two chapters over, Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra. There is a lame man. Listen to verse 10. Paul said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprung up and began walking. Who did the healing? Paul was a, an agent. Holy Spirit did the healing. But he gave a command to the lame man. Stand up. Stand upright. Get on your feet. Take it upon yourself to respond to this opportunity of healing. No one would say that the lame man earned or deserved or caused it all on his own. All right. Acts chapter 16. Just a few more chapters over. Paul and Silas are the ones in prison now. Earthquake happens. The jailer assumes they've all fled. He comes back. He's about to take his own life. Paul speaks up. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here for you. He asks the most important question anyone can ask. What must I do to be saved? In those first two instances, it's clear. The Lord provided the rescue, but people needed to do something to comply with, to receive the offer, to receive the deliverance God was providing. So much of the, the, the religious world would look at a passage like Acts 16 and say, well, when it comes to salvation, you really can't do anything. That either God's chosen you or he hasn't chosen you. And that if he has chosen you, you can't override that will. And if he's not chosen you, you can't override that will. But listen, he asks, what must I do to be saved? Verse 30, he brought them out. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. If you keep reading, what did it mean to believe? That's the promise. Paul says you're asking, implication, can I be saved? You're asking, what must I do to be saved? What does he do? Verse 33, he washes their wounds at once. Represents his penitence, his willingness to wipe their stripes clean after he had caused those to happen or been responsible for those. And they were here, they were innocent. That same hour, that same night, they were baptized, he and his household. They rejoiced, verse 34. Why had they rejoiced? Because he and his household had believed, had believed. So did the jailer save himself? Did the jailer do all of the hard work? No, we wouldn't ar ever argue that. God saved the jailer. But he saved him when he complied to the command, the imperative, to believe in Jesus Christ. Believing, true faith in the New Testament is faith that's active. Faith that complies, faith that submits and is obedient. And so God saved the jailer. God saved the jailer when... He responded to the offer of salvation to believe and obey in Jesus Christ. So the true principle we must always remember is that personal responsibility on our end does not limit how good God is in offering us salvation. We can comply with and accept and obey the terms of salvation. And in no way does that limit how good God is. God is great and merciful and abundant in his mercy and grace. But he still says, here are the things you must do to receive this offer of salvation, this offer of mercy. So back in Acts chapter 2, we see the phrase in verse 40, save yourselves from this crooked generation, this untoward generation. Those folks in the religious world that might say, well, you, you can't do anything. 
You're, you're powerless. You're helpless. You've got to wrestle with. Verse 40 of Acts 2. Save yourselves. Does Peter mean that we do all of the work, that we manufacture this somehow? If you read the whole sermon, if you read what's brought on to that point of Acts chapter 2, it's clear God is still the one offering salvation. But in the same right, God is also making it clear what we do to accept the terms of His salvation and pardon. So go back to chapter 2 of Acts and look at verse 14. Before Peter says, and in, in working his way towards saying verse 40, save yourselves, here's what else he has said. 2 verse 14, this is the opening sentence of his sermon. Remember, they've accused him of being drunk. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice, addressed them, men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give ear to my words. What he's about to say is extremely important. So he says, listen closely and understand and know these things I'm about to say. There's something they need to get and understand that he's, a, he's about to explain. Not only are they not drunk, but he's going to explain to them the significance of this day and this moment. So look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. There it is again. Listen carefully. Listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. See, they can't deny that he did the works. Verse 23, here's the next level of the story, though. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified, you killed by the hands of lawless men. What did God do? God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Yes, God has been victorious through the resurrection. But you see how pointed he is? You killed him. You delivered him up. This is the plan of God. But you are responsible for his death. We all are there with those Jews. Our sin has led Jesus to the cross to die for our sin. Those Jews, many of them had a, a firsthand role in that instance, in that moment. So verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Not a theory. Not a maybe, not a perhaps. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made, God has done something. God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. You see the implications there? A person who's in that audience, who's listening as Peter has said, be sure to listen and listen closely. Now what are we faced with? Faced with this piercing realization that my sin is responsible not only for a death of a man, not just the death of a good man, and not even just the death of an innocent man, but the death of the perfect Son of God. And now God has raised him from the dead, and he is Lord and Christ. What he's done through verse 36 is to make it clear there is a need for rescue. That sin is so bad, it cuts us off from God. It has cost him the blood of his son. He is still God. He raised God, Jesus from the dead. But now there is this sin between us. There is a need for rescue. Remember verse 37. They were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. Homer, another Greek, a classical Greek author, has used that word for cut to the heart to describe horseshoes. Nail those, those pins nailed into the, the horseshoe, into the hoof of a horse. It struck their heart. So they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Just If we pause, I know we love to, to go to Acts 2.38 and it's, it's so powerful and rich. But just imagine the anticipation after they ask that question. And before Peter answers it, verse 38. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to make up for, to respond to killing the innocent, perfect Son of God? God could have said, you can't do anything. You, you cannot make up for it. God has made 
salvation possible in spite of our sin because he loves us. So instead of telling them, nope, you can't because of that or you can't because, um, you know, your will is just imperfect as a human being and, and you can't earn anything, Peter gives them an answer. What he does in verse 38 then to give them the answer is to say there is an offer of rescue available. Think about that. Not only is what 38 says extremely important and necessary for knowing what to do to be saved, but it also makes it clear that offer is available. We have the opportunity, the option to be saved. So verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. Why? Because you were so sinful. Your sin cost Jesus his life. Repent and be baptized. Why? Because you're still lost in your sin. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord, our God, calls to himself. Verse 39 is almost as important as verse 38. Because verse 39 tells us why this chapter is the hub of the New Testament, is the hub of the Bible. It tells us why verse 38 must be highlighted and underlined and a focal point because Peter says, these are the new terms. The new covenant is now here. The forgiveness of sins that Christ came to purchase with his blood is now available for you right now, for your children, for those who are not yet born, for anyone who would listen in the future, God calls through his son, Jesus Christ. Back up in the earlier in the chapter, verse 21, 22, verse 21, when he's quoting from Joel 2, remember it's Joel 2 that he references to tell them, these guys, we're, we're not all drunk. This is a day that's been promised, that's been foretold in Joel chapter 2. And it's verse 32 that he quotes in Acts 2, 21. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I wonder what they thought when Peter quoted that verse. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter there is saying an offer is available. Perhaps, and it's clear to the, the trajectory of the sermon, they didn't realize the need to be saved. But now that he lands in verse 38 with the answer to their question, that also answers verse 21, the quotation from Joel 2.32. Acts 2.38 is how we call upon the name of the Lord. It means the offer is available. But the next step of the sermon, is not, it's not over yet. That's the answer to what they must do. Well, listen to verse 40. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, here's the summary of those many other words. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So it's clear if you're following the whole sermon, Peter's not saying, do all of the work yourself. Earn it. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps and your own strength. God's made it possible. Your sin costs your relationship with God, but God has reached out and made salvation available. But neither is, neither is Peter saying you can't do anything. That as soon as the thought crosses your mind, that as soon as you have this uh, notion, this feeling that you might categorize as belief, that's enough. He's saying, here's the offer, now choose. Now's the time to choose. So really verse 40 becomes the true invitation. The answer to their question is verse 38. Repent, be baptized, be immersed. Every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. But verse 40 is the line in the sand. Here's the time. He's about to say, come as we stand and sing. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And think about the implications of that for a Jew. They're just born into being a Jew. They're, they're always hearing the law. We're, Jew, we're God's people by birth. We're God's people by blood. We just do this because we do this. Now Peter's saying, your sin costs everything between you and God. 
God has made the offer available. Now you must choose. Will you comply with his terms or will you reject? So verse 41, what do they do? So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Did they earn it? Did they work such that God said, well, you, you added enough to your account and so now you're good enough? Well, of course not. But neither did they just have this brain idea, this feeling, this sincere belief. And that mysteriously caused God to reach down and save them. God says, here's the offer, salvation. Here are the clear terms. Because of your belief, because you're willing to repent, and when you are immersed, that's when you are saved. So Peter says, save yourselves. The trajectory is need, offer, response. If you and I were drowning in the ocean, if we're in the middle of Smith Lake drowning, and someone comes up in a boat, they toss us the life preserver. We, we cannot physically make it back to shore and earn that rescue. We'll give out. It's just too far. When he tosses us that life ring, he says, put this around your head, put this around your body. Swim closer to the boat. Or he jumps in the water and he's tethered to the boat and he says, here, grab hold of me. Here, keep your head above water. Here, grab this. See, he's telling us things to do to comply with the salvation he's making possible. That's what God has done. He says, I'm willing to save. And he says, here's when I save, when you comply with these responses to my offer. That personal response by the one needing saving does not diminish the generosity and the compassion of the one doing the rescuing. And so because God has placed parameters and placed expectations for what we must do to receive the gift of his salvation, it does not negate his goodness. And in fact, I think you could argue from Scripture, it would negate his goodness if it was just some kind of open-ended, do it on your own terms. Because he has made it clear, that is as loving as can be, because it gives every person the same choice to hear, to believe, and decide whether or not to obey. Look at this process, this principle elsewhere in Scripture before we wrap up. You see it a couple of times in Philippians. Philippians 2, interesting here, not directly about salvation um, in terms of what we talk about in Acts 2, even though he uses the word salvation. Listen to what he says, Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You read that verse in isolation, you say, oh, well, God's just letting us kind of figure it out ourselves. No, you read it in its context, read it in what Paul's saying. He's saying it's your turn to be responsible. You are saved, you are his child, you've obeyed the gospel, but you've got to keep on maturing. You read the whole letter of Philippians, you know they've got some issues to work through amongst themselves, within the, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of Philippi. He's saying, keep working those things out. And notice the reason why. It's easy to put on a good face when I'm there in your presence. But even more important, in my absence, keep on working. How so? With tremendous fear and trembling. Isn't that interesting? That it's often presented that if we can do something to earn our salvation, that it's a, a thing of pride to teach that or arrogance. Yet Paul says you have a responsibility. To accept that responsibility is the fearful and reverent thing to do. Why? Because listen, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God's the one who's offered to strengthen us, to help us to grow to help us through his word and through prayer and through discipline and through fellowship. And so when we decide to take on the responsibility to grow in those ways, it's God who strengthens us. It's God who helps us to grow. And it's God who's glorified. He had said, Paul had back in chapter 1 in verse 6, that he had began a good work in them, in the Philippians, in the Philippian church. 
And Paul was adamant. He will bring it to completion. He will see you through to your ultimate maturity when Christ returns. So you see much the same principle there in Philippians 2. But also notice chapter 3. This is Paul being personal. It's own life. It's not just telling them, take on the responsibility, accept those terms. But now he's listening to himself. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Why, Paul? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. God makes it possible. God makes it available. But because of that availability, I now press on to make sure I'm keeping on growing and keeping on pursuing it with all that I am. And so, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but, I, but one thing I do, I, I know I've got another level to go. I know I've got more and more to grow into. This one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. I strain forward to what lies ahead. Here's the one thing. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see both sides of this in that one pursuit. Verse 14, I'm pressing on. I'm giving all of my effort. What Peter would say, save yourselves. But I'm doing so for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Something he has made accessible and possible through Jesus Christ. Then he says, verse 15, think about this. Let those who are mature think this way. Sounds like it might be difficult for us to continue to wrestle with and grasp that. So he says, the more you mature the more we begin to understand. We have to do things. We have to respond. We have to obey. We get to obey. But it's because of the offer God makes available and the terms he makes clear. One last example, Galatians 6, a text we all, I think, are, are somewhat familiar with. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You see how this connects? Paul says, you have a responsibility to consider, to think about what you are sowing. It's not a matter of if we're sowing something, it's what we're sowing. You have a responsibility to consider what are the things you're doing, what are you sowing? God is the one who has made it clear. He operates, his world operates by this harvest principle. That whatever is sown is what is reaped. And so we must do because we know the opportunity is now made available. Because we know that's how it operates, how he designed his will to be done. We then have a responsibility to live by that principle. So we can't be deceived in thinking that our actions don't have consequences. We can't be deceived in thinking that somehow we can, can earn it, but neither can we be deceived at somehow thinking that we're just kind of helpless, bobbing, bobbing in the sea and we can't do anything. God is clear and loving. I want you to be saved. I desire all people to come to repentance. But he's also made his terms clear. Thus demands a response by us. And that's the truth of the matter. We all, when faced with the gospel, when faced with the need, when faced with the offer that God makes available, we all have a response. It's our prayer tonight that if you find yourself considering that offer, considering those terms, that your response will be a positive one, that it'll be an affirmative. It'll not be to put it off and wait. It'll not be to reject, to be hard-hearted. It'll be to understand that God is good and gracious and abundant in His mercy. He makes it clear and beautiful even in how we come to obey it. So through faith and repentance, being buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, you can come to Him tonight he promises to wash those, way, those sins away immediately. And on the other side of that water, walk that new life, live for Him, be blessed by Him constantly. If you need to come back to Him after wandering, wandering away from Him, tonight's the night to make that right too. We're so thankful for Riley and that decision that she's made clear today. I'm thankful to see them back uh, this afternoon. They had a, a little bit of a drive this afternoon to go to a funeral, but we're thankful they're back. And be sure you get to know them. If you have any other need, know that we stand ready to help and are here for you. And would you come, and would you come now as we sing together?